and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, creator of the upcoming RPG Omen, any setting, any way. There's so, he has many names, but some may just call him Tim, Mr. Tim Leaner. Hi, how, how you doing today, man? And there's my rec, there's my requisite Monty Python joke. I'm doing wonderful. Thank you so much for having me, Mildred. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming on. So, one of the traditions around here is opening with the humble beginnings, the origin story, if you will. Um, whether for a superhero or supervillain origin story, that's up to you. But walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. All right. Um, so in general, a bit about me. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Tim. I'm 30 years old. I'm from Luxembourg, Europe. Mm -hmm. And um, so I've been playing pen and paper games for a little bit more than 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, I've been introduced by a good friend of mine who, I'm, who I'm, I've met uh in an online game, and he played uh, the Black Eye, um, mm -hmm. a German pen and paper system with yep. me. And I quickly actually changed to Dungeons and Dragons. I've been spreading the word about the awesomeness of pen and paper games because, to me, as somebody who's played video games like since childhood. Uh, a whole new world opened up, like a whole new world of creativity, um, of, of of expressing yourself. And so, to me, it's just like the, the best hobby there is. It's just so much fun, uh, and it's very close to my heart. Mm -hmm. And with now with that in with that in mind, I do find it I do find it amusing that you that you brought up the dark eye since. Everyone, you get, everyone is always shocked when I say that I've co I've covered and run that, but I am, really, <laughs> I am uh, shocked. <laughs> I will, I will, ad I will admit that um, it's only the last couple editions that I that I have um, that I have worked with, um, which which makes cover which made reviewing it tricky because of the fact that I didn't, I didn't, ha I didn't have the, uh, I didn't, I wasn't able to get a kind of sense on how the game evolved over the years from its original incarnation to now. Oh. But I'm oh, I'm aware of the origin story about it about how it start it was going to be a um a Ger a German translation of D&D &D, then TSR pulled out and the guys involved said fine we'll make our own D&D &D with blackjack and hookers. Okay, maybe not the hookers, <laughs> but you get the point. Um I've se I've seen people refer to it as German D and D, and then when I got to play it myself, I'd I had said that's I don't think that's quite accurate. Um, that's very true. I think I think they're actually quite different. I think their approaches are, t to me personally, a bit on opposite sides of the scale. Um, but I th I would say it's the German D and D in terms of dominance like local dominance, because uh, almost everybody who plays pen and paper in Germany knows the system, uh, just as probably anybody in the in the US or in uh, English-speaking parts of the world uh, know Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. I can I can go with I can go with that, but that's a, but that's as far as I, that's as far as I could go with. Um, I had a similar thing going down when at when um. I was starting to discover discover translations of a of what's the largest TTRPG in Japan, um, Sword World. Well, largest homegrown, I should clarify. Um, and if it, if somebody who's only played D and D tries to jump into Sword World, they are go they are going to be um, caught with their pants down <laughs> because because. The only the only connective tissue there's gonna, there's going to be is is a fantasy game. Every, everything everything else you're in a, you're in a completely different park. Um, 
or you or you're like some of the rookies when I when I'd run infinity at my at my LGS and they try and do the open charge approach because that's all they know and end up re end up realizing very quickly you can't do that infinity infinity without get without getting slaughtered uh, you know it's it's a it's a case where where just because something's in a similar medium doesn't mean it's going to play similarly to what you know so you mm. got to you got to take things um up by the, by their rules instead instead of the rules you think that it, on how it should work i mean um, honestly i i feel like people who who told you that uh that um the the two systems are similar either they haven't played both or they have played like the 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 only things they have experienced so far is like maybe D and D and Cyberpunk Red or something like extremely different. Um, I had I had a bit of fun at Bill of Lost Souls' expense when it came to Cyberpunk Red because of their whole because of that whole hey let's let's stat out the cast of Cyberpunk Edge Runners in D in D and D and mm. <laughs> that was a terrible like, that was a terrible move to make. I can imagine. Uh, they play. They played the. They played the apology tour, but at the same. But I had responded to the whole thing, saying, "I don't think you're sorry. You're just sorry you got caught." <laughs> uh, but now with Omen, uh, it is. It. I definitely see a bit. A bit of the. Um, the, a bit of the DNA from more twenty-sided approaches, but there's there are a few um, there are a few questions that I did I did have on how how certain things work since the core mechanic, as I understand it, is still D twenty aim high. Um, yeah, that's is, uh, perfectly right. I can uh, I can quickly walk you through it if you wanna. Um, um, the first qu the first question that I'd have is. Is that the only die that's going to be using that you're going to be using a la um, Talus a la Talus Lanta? On oh, Talus Lanta, what? Um, what I'm sorry. Is what I'm saying is is the D20 the only die that's going to get used, or are other die used for th for things like damage and the like, or is it a pure ah, D20 mm. roll the way things like the way things like Talus Lanta are a pure D20 roll? Ah, all right, all right, all right. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, it is a pure D20 system. Uh, for example, damage die you mentioned. Uh, th there is none. Uh, damage is fixed in Omen mm -hmm. because, uh, to me personally, from from my experience, uh, making skill checks and stuff like that is always uh, a lot of fun. Rolling net twenties and stuff like that is amazing. But my players, or from, from my experience, rolling damage die, it's usually more frustrating if you roll low than it is exciting if you roll high. So for, for this and for the sake of just uh, making it faster, uh, we decided to just remove damage rolls. So, so, so any... damage is set? Yeah, damage is set. Mm -hmm. But um, any any dice you ever roll in the system is always one d twenty, and it's always uh, like a, an, a, an ability roll would be in d and d. So it's an attribute roll. It's tied to one of the eight attributes. Mm -hmm. And speaking of that, you're using a um, a point distribution approach when it comes to attribute po when it comes to attribute points among the eight um, attributes, and. Mm -hmm. Well, it do, well, it's clear that it do, it does ca it does cascade into uh, into other um, factors. Um, one thing one thing I'm curious ab about because of the fact that it's po that it's point based is if you, if if in a full book you'd be pu you'd be putting in advice as far as recommended ranges as well as modifying that modifying that point total for. Um, higher or lower powered campaigns. Mm. Uh, that's a great point, actually. Um, so at the moment, there's a limitation that a, a first level character can't have an attribute exceeding twelve, mm -hmm. um, and uh, like like later on, the attribute can't exceed eighteen. So this is for balance reasons. Mm -hmm. 
um, except for that, there's no limitations. But it's actually great advice. Uh, so I'm definitely going to check this out and uh, maybe add a little optional uh, optional advice for, for uh, modifying the mm. base amount of points. Yeah, because... There's there is always the possibility that some people will want will want to do more high powered cam high powered campaigns. I know th I know that there's the narrative, especially in the D and D crowd, of oh no nobody plays high level because it's boring. Um, if there if there is a that is a multi that is a more multifaceted problem than people seem to think. A lot of people will just go with. Well, no, nobody plays high level because because there's no ch because there's no challenge. There's no challenge because it's, because the because it isn't supported since there's that hyper focus on the on the um new game exper on the new game experience. The problem mm -hmm. th the problem is you can only you can only run begin you can only run be beginner games so so long before people become more experienced with the system. Um. It's far it's far better to have a pipeline of beginners to to experts. Um, not far. I liken it to how there's a kind of farm system with um, athletes in in most sports. You know, you go you go in. Not so you sound too American with it, but you you get seasoning in the minor leagues, and then you and then you get called up. Then you get called up or or drafted or the like. You're Going through this lengthy seasoning process before you end up reaching the pros, mm -hmm. um, but a lot of a lot of games just focus so much on the minor leagues without giving that guidance. Um, uh, one and, one other thing I can tell you actually mm -hmm. uh, in that regard is that uh, Omen is designed to go up to level ten, mm -hmm. and it's a linear progression, so there's not as much power creep. And we're trying to keep the higher levels um, pretty balanced and um, like interesting for encounters. So, since a character does gain two attribute points whenever they do gain a level, mm -hmm. um, to to kind of tie in with uh, ch starting with a different amount of attributes, there will definitely be rules covering starting with an above level one character. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to the um, when it comes to the skill trees, um, as I understand it, you st you start out with ten um, sk you start out with ten skill points, and what you're what you're able to get is dependent on the tier, which is t which is tied into um, the attribute of mm -hmm. the, of that particular one. Um, is it is it a case where each where each each attribute has has one um, skill tree, or are there, or do you have plans on multiple skill trees for each attribute? So in the current uh, advanced readers copy, there's forty four skill trees mm -hmm. with a total of over three hundred skills. So there's def there's there's no attribute among the eight attributes which only has one skill tree. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to say that the mind attribute, which governs magic, has the most skill trees because there's basically one thematic skill tree for each school of magic. Um, but I, as far as I remember, every attribute has at least three skill trees. Mm -hmm. And when it now, when it comes to when it comes when it comes to equipment, like you met you mentioned that we that um, weapon that um, damage is is going to be set. Um, one thing I'm one thing I'm curious about is with is um how do you this is going to be a tricky one, but how do you handle um dual wielding? Because there's some there's some that put a lot of pre prerequisites on dual wielding and there's some that don't but the advan the advantage isn't all isn't all that much um what approach do you have regarding characters who want to do dual wielding whether that whether that be a, whether that be a pair of swords or even just treating sword and board as dual wielding mm -hmm. um so 
First off, quickly, yes, uh, sword and board would kind of be dual wielding because uh, shields are considered a weapon for the sake of simplicity. But um, this is going to be a bit of a longer answer. Uh, Omen uses turn-based combat, kind of similar to Pathfinder, where a character has three actions and there's no distinction between bonus action, action, reaction, uh, this kind of stuff. So, in general, when a character starts their turn next to an enemy they want to attack, they can, in theory, take the attack action three times, uh, getting a higher negative penalty with each attack, which they can lower through skills. Um, so if, if they want to focus on a lot of fast attacks, this is possible. Um, each weapon has a distinctive property. So, for example, a curved sword has the fluid property which increases the weapon's damage if you move on your turn because it supports a very fluid uh, movement-based fighting style. Um, so it is an, an inherent advantage to have two different weapons with different properties. But there's also uh, a few weapons, like for example brass knuckles, which have the paired property, um, which gives them uh, an even bigger advantage if you w uh, wield the same weapon twice. In general, um, if you're dual wielding, if you take the attack action the first time on your turn, you just make two attacks. Mm -hmm. So basically somebody who wields a single weapon and uh, commits their whole turn to attacking with three actions makes three attacks. A character who dual wields, who commits their whole turn to attacking, makes four attacks. Mm -hmm. And so you... S when you say when you say it's analogous to Pathfinder, what immediately came to mind, especially with the, how you set up the actions, is um, Pathfinder Second Edition rather than First. Um, mm, yeah. And yes. given th given that, are the when it comes to, are you pl do you have it that um cert that certain more advanced actions would take or cer certain more advanced tactics would take multiple actions in in a given um, round? I was thinking about this a lot in the development process, I'm going to say, like really quite a lot. Um, there was a point in development because um, there are rules for sieges and large-scale battles where some of these actions would take several actions to commit, but then I just changed uh, the time frame. Uh, battles take place over, so just like a turn stretches a longer period, so the, this, there's nothing like that. The only thing where a character needs more than a single action uh, is a mechanic in spell casting. actually. Uh, there's a couple of spells which have the channel um, like, like, like feature. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, a character who has the spell Hellfire, for example, which is like the the strongest, most damaging spell. It's you can kind of imagine it like a fireball in D and D. Mm -hmm. um, so, a character who has Hellfire, they can choose to either cast it as an action and just go like poof, everything explodes, or they can choose to channel it, meaning they cast it over a turn. Mm -hmm. um, they started as an action and they ended as another action on their next turn. And in between, every party member or any ally that's near them can use an action, even if they are not a spellcaster themselves, to kind of like lend their assistance to the spell, uh, chanting it with the spellcaster, lending their energy to them to make the uh, spell much, much more powerful. Mm-hmm. And when when you say that that they can assist in that, is it a case where the benefit from assisting is um, scaled based on how many people um, aid, or is it ju or is it just aiding on the check um, total? It's not just aiding on the check for most of the spells. Um, so this actually works. Uh, Omen uses a mana resource mm -hmm. instead of something like spell slots. Thank God. Um, 
<laughs> so what's interesting about this or to me fun about this is every character has mana. Uh, just those who decide to become spellcasters via skills, uh, they can use their own mana to cast spells. But everybody has some inherently and can use it for various things like using magic items. But they can also use it when channeling. So how this works is when somebody channels a spell, they can take an action to spend two mana to increase the spell's effect. This uh, specific effect is specified for each spell. So for example, for Hellfire, every character that uh, channels with the spellcaster um, uh, increases the spell's damage. Mm-hmm. And I, I can certainly get that. Uh, and I'm actually glad that it's using a mana point system inst instead of using the Vancian model, especially since I have I have not shied away from how critical I am of that particular model. I will at most tolerate it, but I will never mm. be in a position where I like it. Mm. Uh, large, largely because of, the, because of a couple of things. One... When you have a limited resource, players are going to be de are going to be conservative with it, and sometimes they can be too conservative, which leads to what I like to call the rainy day paradox. You know, saving something for a rainy day, even if that rainy day never comes, also known as mm -hmm. ninety nine mega elixirs. No, I can't. It I might can't... actually be true that the rainy day phenomenon might even be very prominent in, in some of Omen because um, I can tell you I didn't try to balance spells against like martial characters spells are better than what most martial characters can do which is because mana is very very limited actually and there's nothing like cantrips or, or any spells that don't use up mana like every spell uses a bit of mana and they are just, uh, a lot of them are extremely powerful. Like if you take a spell that makes you faster, it lasts for a whole day. Uh, most of the damaging spells deal about twice as much damage as most compa uh, comparable uh, weapon attacks. And the idea behind this is that for something that's so limited, it should be more powerful. Like I'm really running with, un unless you make a character that is both a martial and a magical character, which is totally possible, of course. Mm -hmm. You can actually make an entirely non-combat character with Omen, who's just like a speaker or just a cook or just a crafter or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but if you go mixed, it's a bit different, of course. But if you don't, you are going to be a bit more squishy than your melee character. You really are going to be a bit more squishy. There's, no, there's basically nothing like mage armor or um, stuff that makes you tougher because I don't want to have any illusion of choice. I want everything to really feel unique and make you feel unique. So it might be necessary for the party to protect their spellcaster, but when the spellcaster does their thing, it's going to be much, much more worth it. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I can I can see I can see that I can see that approach. Um, I think I think the only time I've had issue with the um, marsh with the uh, martial and mage di dynamic is when one of them has um, very little in the way of meet of meaningful options that they can utilize, and that that's uh, that's. That's where you get the idea of fighters as Babby's first character, uh, which I've always I've always put I've always pushed against. <laughs> uh, though fortunately, with the with having a with having a skill tree, that's not something that is as as much of a of a potential issue. Uh, I'm not. I'm not saying we need to put um, a bunch of a bunch of martial actions, as as if this is tome as this is, this is tome of battle. But there are. But there are. There are clearly ways to make it work. Um, I am. A, I am a bit curious if, when it comes to the development of the 
of these um, skill trees and just the sheer amount, just the broadness of skills if anyone's tr anyone's tried to make a Skyrim comparison or just Elder Scrolls in general <laughs> um so I am uh, as, as I actually mentioned before I'm just coming back from Spiel Essen mm -hmm. um, and I, I pitched the the game to so many people and I actually made the comparison myself <laughs> because it is somewhat helpful and I feel like the size of each skill tree having four tiers and each tier having two skills so each skill tree is about eight skills it's kind of similar mm -hmm. um, and thematically some are similar as well I think it's a fair comparison to make I it's been so long since I played Skyrim and I didn't look at it during development so I don't think there's any actual overlap but I think it's a it's a perfectly fine visualization. Well, you're not doing the learning by doing thing, so you've got that going for you. <laughs> it, I've I've never I've never been a fan of that of that of that sort of approach. Um, mm. Well, I, most mostly because it's very very easy to cheese it. <laughs> um, the in, and that's both in, both in video games and to a certain degree in tabletop games I've seen people cheese the learning by doing thing and I I I always think that's the reason why you don't see as many people take that approach um the now with with that in mind um when it comes to mo when it comes to monsters given the given the setting agnostic approach that you're going with um, do you plan on having a monster creation guide within the book? There already is, actually. Um, so there is a bestiary with over 60 creatures already, like, like coming with the book. But there's also, like in the, the, the Game Master section, um, I, th there's a lot of advice about how to make your own creatures, how to modify existing creatures. And I actually like the 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 section actually includes like how i made monsters myself like i it includes the math behind it it includes tables which i am using myself when making creatures um so i'm trying to be as transparent as possible i i know that for a setting agnostic book i can't possibly include all monsters and characters that people might want to use so um, I'm I'm really trying to give people all the tools they can possibly need. Mm-hmm. Because the thing, I've the thing that's always tricky when when it comes to this idea of of using a certain using a certain game for all for all kinds of fantasy is that a lot of a lot of people, as I, and I mentioned this to you when we went live, have a very limited view of. Um, f of fantasy. Yes. Um, yes. The and the anal the I got I've I've had to deal with people for years claiming that th claiming that they could use um D and D five D and D five E and specifically and just D and D in general to run any kind of fantasy, and this is all this is always the um conundrum that I put them in for that. So if you had what would you s so a bit a bit of a pop quiz. What is the most common way to equip a a fighter or similar archetype? In term in terms of weapons. Mm, like like in in terms of weapons, and any weapon works really. Oh, um, yeah, the most, the most I, common I, way is sword and board. Ah, all right. Like in 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 our world, <laughs> you mean? Yeah, oh, sure. Or like in fantasy games. Yeah. So. How are you going to do? How are you going to do that when, if if um if the campaign is being is being run in, in, say, say a fantasy version of J of Japan or India where, um where she where um, in the case of Japan where shields of in that sense, aren't nearly as much of a thing, and mm. in the case of something like India where the sword isn't the weapon that has the biggest cultural footprint, it's the bow. Yeah. Oh. So, so in general, um, 
like first i i try to in in everything i do really i try to take culture out as much as possible as you mentioned like i think it's terrible that a lot of people associate um fantasy with this kind of european medieval thing um and i think a lot of people are ignorant about where some fantasy creatures even come from like my minotaur was sirens and stuff like that that like, everything comes from somewhere right mm -hmm. uh, a lot of these from greek mytholo mythology and stuff um so for example um i don't have a weapon called scimitar or a weapon called katana i have a weapon called curved sword because that is an archetype that exists in a lot of cultures um, and it might not perfectly represent katanas or the way they were used but I try to enable this kind of playstyle as much as possible um, for the sword and board versus only using a sword kind of fighting style there is uh, via skills a perfectly reasonable way to make both good um, so this uh, kind of works. It's a thing of probably as well like a, a dungeon or a game master has to communicate to their players uh, like, like if you want to run a Far Eastern campaign or a culture that doesn't rely on shields or something like that. You should probably communicate with your players what your mm -hmm. options are like probably yeah, you, don't use a shield. Do. I usually do. I usually do. I I will write out a um, I I will write out a primer that's that's a couple of pages long, and make make clear in that primer what kind what kind of things, um, I'm I'm encouraging and discouraging. Um, I've mm. done, um, when I when I would run, for instance, Lex Arcana, um, I w I would write in I would write in bold letters. Do not do not th do not think that you're doing gladiator or or anything like that. This is an investigative, hev heavy yeah. ca heavy campaign. Do not yeah. do not do a combat centric character. If you do, I take no responsibility for for you having to sit on the sidelines for long amounts of time. Yeah, because it's just not going to be fun. And me personally, uh, me and my sessions I play and the Omen rulebook as a whole, we are role play focused. Um, if you want super gritty, super intense combats and dungeon crawls, it's probably not the perfect system for you. Uh, there's a lot of co rules for combat, and I think combat is a lot of fun. But if this is something you're like really into, um, there's probably better systems. At the same time, I want to say that for the kind of weapon types... Uh, and this ties in with what you said about advising your players. There's a few weapons that are extremely niche, which I thought don't fit any other archetypes. Like, for example, there's there's hook swords, there's an iron fan, uh, how it was typically used in uh, Japanese culture. There's a parrying dagger, which was uh, used much later in history in a lot of fencing fighting styles. So all these options are included in the base book, but it doesn't mean that you should use all of them at once. Unless you play a high fantasy setting where you're just like, oh wait, all of these things exist at once. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for me, I'm always trying to encourage people to put more thought into how they equip their character, especially if they're more, um, more, especially if they're more on the martial end of things. And fortunately, fortunately, um, it's a and it's actually it's actually more the more the video game crowd that that is more easy is more easily able to get that than um and than the more traditional crowd, which is what which is why I've said that my I've said that my best students are gamers and weebs, <laughs> <laughs> um, because and I I. Oh, sorry. Because because of the fact that they're not that they haven't developed the, developed too much in the way of inbuilt assumptions. Mm. And I think that's a great uh, great point as well. Um, I love it 
when when players actually think about their like the weapons they are using and stuff like that and i wanted to encourage uh like when white while writing the rules i want to encourage martial characters carrying sidearms and stuff like that because um and i personally think this is a great idea on my part it probably exists somewhere else but i thought of it and <laughs> so how how we handle things is every weapon has a range um usually from zero which is basically adjacent uh to up to three for melee weapons uh this is in in meters as of now in the final release there will be an imperial or like an american system as well uh so zero to three meters and ranged weapons up to like uh, 80 meters i think and there's a, a mechanic called the restricted condition which means that if more than half of your character um, is like crowded by monsters or if you're like standing next to a wall or something like that you suffer the restricted condition which gives you a negative modifier on attack rolls equal to your weapon's range um, so if you're using a pole arm which is generally a great weapon historically a great weapon um, you, you will have a lot of range you do great damage and everything and it's awesome in an open field but if you're fighting in a tunnel uh it, um, or a tunnel might be a bad example because of the enemy is running at you. Uh, it's still kind of good. But if you're fighting with your back in a corner, a polearm is not as great once the enemy is in your face. Um, so this is a situation where like, taking out your dagger or your sidearm, your short sword, whatever, is awesome because you no longer suffer this negative modifier from being restricted. Mm-hmm. And when it com when it comes to uh, when it comes to the chances concept, which is bit which is largely built around um, luck. Yeah. Would <laughs> I'd say from what I'm from what I'm seeing, um, that would be that would be the game's equivalent to a concept I've referred to as the extra effort mechanic. Um, a lot of games will have will have that limited use pool of so, of some way to either give either give a character an extra push or or let them have a let them have a do over or in some mm -hmm. cases an edit button. Mm -hmm. um, like e and extra effort mechanic is just my catch all for these particular systems, whether it be Edge in Shadowrun, Moxie in e in mm -hmm. Eclipse Phase, Willpower in World of Darkness. Would you say that chances is your equivalent in that? I would think so. I mean, I can elaborate a bit. Mm -hmm. um, in general, I call luck as an attribute. So luck is one of the eight attributes, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of my failure prevention attribute. Um, because I know a lot of people feel strongly about not wanting to fail specific roles and stuff like that. And it is a stat which some players will probably use as a dump stat, but if you feel strongly about it, it's an awesome stat because how this works is if you fail any kind of roll, you can spend one of your chances to roll the to roll it again using luck mm -hmm. uh, as as an attribute. So if you have low luck, it's not going to be good. If you have high luck, it's going to be amazing, especially since the luck skill trees tied to the attribute increase the number of chances you have per day. So this is really meant to be like a, a failure, failure prevention system that is in the player's hand. Like, do you care about it? Do you want to increase it? Do you want to invest in it? Um, and if not, then not. Mm -hmm. um, luck in general? Is also like it's a bit of pet peeve of myself. I have to say, like playing Oblivion, for example, my character was all like statted out towards luck. But um, it's also a great tool for game masters because I personally, whenever I run campaigns, there's a lot of situations in other systems where I didn't know what I wanted the player to roll on. Like when they ask me stuff like, is this NPC currently there? What is this enemy carrying? 
this kind of thing where I might not have prepared an answer to. And whenever such a situation arises, I'm going to be like, just make a luck roll. Let's see where it takes us. Uh, it's fun. It's funny you mentioned. It's funny you mentioned Oblivion, since well, I honestly prefer that over 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 Skyrim. But uh, <laughs> I I am significantly I am significantly biased for that and Morrowind for for a couple of reasons. One, um, actually having a class actually having a class system instead of trying to make everybody the sa the same um stealth mage archer. <laughs> oh, so you're actually not fond of skill-based systems, are you? <laughs> um, I'm. F it's more of it's more of the it's more of the implementation. Mm, um, right. the f the f it's it's a it's a case of a false choice thing. The way Skyrim's kit is set up, it's very clear the op the optimal setup is stealth mage archer. Some of that is due to the fact that first person that its particular brand of first person combat is not great. Mm. Um. I know some people say that you can't do good first-person combat. I don't agree with that because Machin X came out in 2000, Breakdown came out in 2004, and um, Kingdom Come Deliverance came out a few years ago. And all three of all three of them are able to do a better job. But I have I have joked about the I have made a few running running jokes about um, the the biggest elf hater in all of fantasy, um, Pelinol Whitestrake. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I feel like I'm the biggest elf hater in fantasy. <laughs> but uh, yeah, 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 but you, yeah, but you have, you didn't, um, you did, you didn't, ca you didn't cause a, whole, you didn't cause, um, elf genocide like the way he did. It's true. I mean, it's a uh, redeeming quality of mine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it's it. Oh, and as far as far as why why the elf hates um a lot a lot of um a lot of the a lot of a lot of experiences with with D with certain elves in D and D uh, and and elves otherwise um I've jokingly I've jokingly said that they don't need to have pointed ears for me to call them an elf just any any race that has that same level of smugness um. Get gets it gets put in gets put in the bin. Some more, some yeah. more than others. Um, yeah. The the Altmer though the Altmer in Elder Scrolls deserve deserve the absolute worst. To the question of if the if if this if this axe is is not is not meant to is not meant to cut at ever at every single elf that ever lived. Why is it sharp? But I, put, I I don't know what the obsession with like smug elves or super arrogant elves is. I've never been a big fan. Uh, I feel like if uh, if a long living uh, species like elves actually existed, I don't know if they would be that smug. Oh. And I mean, I mean, by contrast, a lot of a lot of dwarves in in fantasy series can can be assholeish, but at least they're upfront about it. Yeah, I mean that's right because the premise is the same, right? It's a, they usually live longer than humans, and but but like it just branches out. Elves become they are beautiful, ethereal, wise, smug, and uh, they don't need to sleep, according to some systems. And on the other side, dwarves who live just as long sometimes are just silly little guys. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Oh, and but e even even with that even with that silliness, the the bigger thing is n is not them being smug, but rather being um stubborn. <laughs> but um, but I think that is a fair quality when you're old. Like uh, I have met so many old people who are just very stubborn. Oh, <laughs> uh, although some some people. I was I was a grumpy young man, and as, and as I get older, I just I just I I the grumpiness didn't li didn't leave. Oh, um, valid. Um, <laughs> most mostly because mostly because it was my job to cl to clean up the, to clean up the messes. So when I when I saw comedies like the like the thick of it, um, I under I understood <laughs> the ins the insanity of be of being the one, of being the one guy the one competent person in a room full of idiots. Oh, <laughs> but 
Uh, with that, when I looked at how advancement worked, I ended up getting the vibe that in this ca in this case, it is it is built more on um mo more on milestones or on sto or on story beats rather than on experience. Is that how is that how it's going to end up working? Yes. That's perfectly right. So as I mentioned before, my personal sessions are much, much more roleplay focused. And this is kind of what Omen is meant to be used for. Like really roleplay, like a big, a bigger roleplay focus. We, we streamline the rules. We try to make it accessible and everything so that there's more time for roleplaying. And I personally don't think that tracking experience points and stuff like that is encouraging of that kind of gameplay. So for now, we've only included milestone progression. Mm -hmm. And unless a lot of um, my audience wants me to integrate some sort of experience system, I'm not gonna. <laughs> It's no skin off my back if 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 it isn't, and I end up using milestone design anyways, even when I'm not supposed to. Mm. Um, or in, or in some in some cases mission based um, de design, depending on the game in question. Yeah, but... I, I don't want to hate on on experience systems. I think it's perfectly fine if you use it. It's probably a great fit for some tables. But it's not the kind of gameplay I want to encourage mm -hmm. in, in this case. Yeah. So with that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as a total page count? At the moment, we're sitting at 230 pages. Um, accounting layout changes, we will be at about 250. And with current like outstanding changes and revisions, especially with a lot of the great feedback I got at Spiel, the final page count will probably be between 250 and 300. All right, that's a re that's a reasonable size, I'd say. It's cer it's certainly it's certainly more reasonable than the monstrosity I'm lo um, looking at on my shelf that I that is Hero System. <laughs> how how much does how much pages does Hero System have? Um, I've never held it in my hand for for just <laughs> ca for just character creation. 600. Okay. I mean, <laughs> you can definitely do that. <laughs> it's a choice. Like, I was, I recently actually um, held a physical copy of Pathfinder in my hands for the first time because it's not quite as popular around here. Um, just held it in the hands for the first time. And I was actually surprised that this is already like 600 pages. Yeah, oh, I, I think have to it was like that. I have to correct myself. Um, Hero system character creation is 466 pages. Um, oh, right. Combat yeah. and adventuring is 322. <laughs> um, in its in its defense, um, a game like Hero System is a full on universalist approach, mm. um, as opposed to fantasy agnostic. Yeah. So, so when yeah. and. There's nothing wrong with going full universalist, but it does come with the consequence of the that um you have to account for a hell of a lot more. Yeah, there's like so. This is why I specifically said, all right, I want to make a, a generic or fantasy agnostic system, but I want to make it like accessible and easy to use, right? Uh, and which is why I said I'm just going to focus on fantasy. I can't do all the other things. That's just going to be too much. But I mean, for people who are into this, Hero System is probably like, if you really want to get into the rules, if you want to want to cover it all, uh, it sounds like an amazing system. Well, it's, it, it, it is an interesting beast, and it's been, it's been around for quite a, for quite a while. Um, some people are going to swear by it because its core die mechanic is 3D6. Uh in a, because because of bell curve, you you hear this you hear the same thing from GURPS fans regard regarding regarding a D six base bell curve rather than um, D twenty. I'm I'm neutral on the on that. Um, for me, it's a case of you you can go whichever way you prefer, but e but each one is going to have um, consequences. 
Um, and because the 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 selling point with a lot of universalist games is, oh, you can run just about anything with with it. Yeah, you can, but you are going. But the GM is going to be put is going to have to put in the work. And mm. there's no get there's no real getting around that fact. Um, yeah. But... And when uh, a little thing about this um, for Omen, what what was important to me was a very clear distinction. Um, the Omen core rules, like the the product we're working on, the the one we're advertising here, the the, the rules you read, and everything like that. This is really meant to be the core rules. I don't want to have big supplements. I don't want to have uh, my rules spread out over several books or something like this. I am planning to release like a, a setting that goes with it if people really want to. Um, but you can still, because everything is written neutrally, there's no cultural... Um, no, no cultural uh, ties in or anything like that. But I really want to have this very, very clear distinction because in the past, I almost only played in my own world. And like when playing a system like Dungeons and Dragons, I always had to take like a step back and like put in the work to remove all of their cultural fluff so it's ready for me to, to use it. So I always had to put in like twice the amount of work. Mm -hmm. and it's something that um, I was really hoping to accomplish with this, to to prevent this. Yeah, I can I can certainly get that. Now, I will I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how um, Omen develops with t with time. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and braving the hell of time zones to come all the way to my temple. Of course, thank you so much for, for welcoming me in your temple. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>